today we are doing another programming stream, as I said, but this one is slightly different. Um, as you may or may not know, on Sundays I've been working on Tabletop, which is a board game app that I've been developing. Um, it's in progress and it's still going. We're still planning on doing that on Sundays, Sunday mornings. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, when I'm working on that, it's fairly similar to things I'm doing at work. Um, and I work professionally doing web development and I work with React, honestly, a lot of the time. And um, for tabletop, I'm using, it's a mobile app, which is a little different, right? But like, it's still, in a lot of ways, very, very similar to web development. And I am uh, using React Native, which obviously is different from React, but it's also very similar. It's more similar than it is different. Um, so I want to do things that are more different from that because I enjoy, you know, trying out new things and that sort of stuff. Um, and so I put a poll up on Twitter that you may or may not have seen. And uh, Reno and Mo, by the way, I finished. In case you want to follow me on Twitter. Um, and these are my two options, either learning Haskell, which is a, a functional programming language that I'm interested in learning. And I got a book for it, actually, so I don't know it's cool. Um, and then also uh, learning from scratch game dev slash C++. So that's what we're doing. This one, the vote. Cool. Um, so the goal is, is I've been very interested in <clears throat> sort of game dev from a technical perspective. Like it's a really interesting thing that deals a lot more with like low level performance than I generally care about um, or have to care about, I guess. Um, and so that is like very different for me. And also I play video games and like them. So like the idea of making one is kind of cool. Um, now I will uh, add on here and say that I don't really have like a good idea for a game right now, but the technological side of it is really interesting to me. Um, so because of that, I've been interested in doing this for a little bit. So I have a friend who has done some of this stuff for Scratch before or from Scratch before. And he recommend recommended the um, this tutorial, which I've also seen before. It's this learn OpenGL tutorial. And apparently OpenGL is like legacy or, you know, things are happening to it, but this is a good way to like get introduced to graphics programming, which I'm particularly interested in. Um, but the problem is, is they were like, hey, uh, you should have a decent knowledge of the C++ programming language. And I, I'll be honest with you. So my, my first class in college was a C++, our introduction to programming class. And so I use C++ somewhat, and I don't know how much I remember. Um, and I feel like my learning, because it was an intro class and um, you know, we didn't really go over a lot. So um, I figured reapproaching it, looking at the tutorials again, it's probably a good idea because, you know, I know how to program better now than I did then, I think. And uh, it'll come out, be good to see it with fresh eyes. I think I remember a lot of it. So some of the stuff we might breeze through, to be honest, but <clears throat> we're going to see how that goes. So um, I'm going to try and, yeah, like I said, I think a lot of this will be pretty quick just because I will like probably, it'll probably jar my memory pretty fast. Um, the goal though is I'm really excited to get into graphics programming. That's more what I care about more so than actual learning C++. I just want to make sure my knowledge is up to snuff enough to where I can do this. Now what I probably should do and what will probably be smart is just go through the first part of this tutorial and see you know, can I understand it with my current knowledge of C++? But I figure, you know, it can't hurt to go over a little bit of a refresher for C++ stuff, but this may be quick. Um, or I might skip to like the more complicated part of this website, um, just to, just for, for things to expedite along. But yeah, so that's, that's sort of what we have in mind today. Um, and I am uh, pretty excited about that. It's gonna be fun. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do real quick is check out the table of contents for the C++ tutorials website. We're using learncpp.com, which is linked to by this OpenGL tutorial. Uh, they say if you don't have much experience in C++, you can get the free tutorials. Great. So uh, quite a few of these things I'm going to like remember pretty well. And it's like, again, I'm torn on what I should uh, go over. So I guess we'll just try and run through this first chapter real quick. Um, like I said, I'm not too concerned with a lot of this because I think I'll remember this pretty well, but. And it does seem like this tutorial is somewhat geared towards uh, absolute beginner programmers, which I'm not, thankfully. Um, so I don't have to like learn how to program. I just need to learn how to program in C++, so. Yeah, so that's what we're doing today. 
Um, you know, if you have questions or anything like that, uh, as always, please feel free to ask them. Uh, and then, yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it. So comments, I know how to do single lines, and then you can do uh, multi-lines with uh, slash star. <clears throat> uh, yep, I know how comments work. Uh, yep, okay. I'm not going to worry about that. I know how comments work. Um, I also know how variables work. Variable instantiation. So I should probably... Uh, I think I just do int main. I don't think I have to give it parameters. Um, so it's just int x. I believe I can also do... Uh, I can declare an initial value there as well, I'm pretty sure. That's an integer, int a, int b, you can use a comma. Um, that's wrong, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Just put them on best lines though. Put them on different lines. Um, great, variable assignment and initialization. Yeah, so you can say width and then assignment, or you can just do both. Or, sorry, that's not actually what that is. Um, copy and direct initial... Okay, yeah, this is copy initialization. Great. Uh, direct initialization. What's the difference here? Um, C++ supports three basic ways to initialize. First, we can do a copy initialization by using an equal sign. Um, this copies the value on the right-hand side of the equals into the variable being created. Okay, that makes sense. Next, we can also do direct initialization by using parentheses. Uh, oh, I actually didn't know that. But for some advanced types, direct initialization can perform better than copy. Direct was recommended over copy initialization. Oh, I didn't know that actually, weird. Okay, so brace, brace initialization uh, uses curly braces. The direct form is generally for per preferred. Oh, that's really weird. What? I didn't know this was a thing. Okay, that's really odd actually. I don't know if I love that, but sure. Um, okay. Favor direct brace initialization whenever possible. Many examples were written before that existed and thus they'll use copy or direct. Interesting. I didn't, I actually had zero clue this was a thing. Weird. Is there a direct or brace assignment? No. Okay. Use an explicit explicit initialization value for actually using that value. Um, okay. Initialize your variables upon creation. Sure. Initializing multiple variables, you can do A, B, copy. Okay, so you just use commas, sure. This is wrong because, yeah, it says A and B equals 5. Yep. That's a little pitfall. Okay, see, I mostly remember almost all of this. I remember the one thing, though, that, like, they... they I feel like they taught us all the time, which, it, in retrospect, seems like an awful idea, is the whole using uh, namespace std. Um, or using namespace standard, right? So when you do C out, you can just do, um, like... Can I do Control Shift K? I don't use Visual Studio, so I'm trying to. I was like, I should probably use Visual Studio and not try and set up with Visual Studio code because that's like probably more work than it needs to be. I have to like, include IO stream here. God dang it, I can't type. Okay. I don't have to set my phone, I don't think. Okay, so it's control F5. Yeah, so this is something we did in school that I think is generally considered bad practice, actually, is that we did this using namespace standard. So instead of typing uh, standards colon colon C out, you just put C out. 
Which, yeah, in retrospect seems awful because, like, yeah, it's just very ambiguous and, like, doing this is, yeah, just five extra characters, I guess, but, like, that to me is way better. And then it still compiles the same, I believe. Should at least. Oh, I put a tick there. That won't compile the same. What? Okay. Yeah, so like I remember I see how it works. See, I mostly remember almost all of this. And then like the other thing that's probably worth like mentioning is like you have like int star um, test is a, a pointer to an integer, right? So I, I have to do test equal. Uh, how do I initialize that, I guess? Like, pointers is more what I'm worried about. I remember, like, the basic syntax. The syntax isn't hard. Um, okay, so where is that at? Okay, I think I know how functions work. I basically know how local scope works. Yeah, I wonder if I can actually just start, now that I'm looking at this, I wonder if I can just start the OpenGL tutorial, and if I see anything I don't understand, I can just bullshit it. That seems like a better idea, because, like, yeah, I just don't need to go through all of this, because I, like, remember most of this. Again, I think it'll come back to me pretty fast. All right, we're going to do that in here. Let me... We're going to do a good, quick little change here. I'll change my title to just learning OpenGL, because that's what we're doing. Great. Okay, I've got this tab open. Let's go ahead and get started here. OpenGL, I put this in reader mode, amazing. OpenGL is just a specification, great. Um, the interesting reader can the OpenGL specification. It's a good read if you want to dive into the details. Okay, I don't really want to do that right now. Uh, in the old days using OpenGL meant developing an immediate mode, often referred to as the fixed function pipeline, which was an easy to use method for drawing graphics. Most of the function of OpenGL was hidden inside the library and developers don't actually have much control over how to do its calculations. Um, great. <coughs> immediate mode is really easy to use and understand, but it is extremely inefficient. For that reason, the specifications start to deprecate immediate mode. Okay. Uh, core profile, which is the division that removed all functionality. Okay. It's more difficult to learn. Okay, that's fine. Why would I learn OpenGL 3.3 when OpenGL 4.6 is out? Uh, okay. The great feature of OpenGL is the support of extensions. Uh, the developer has to query whether any of those extensions are available before using them. Uh, this allows the developer to do things better or more efficient based on when an extension is available. Okay. Um, does this tell me how to install it, actually? Yeah, okay, okay. I'll just keep reading this through this. So, state machine. OpenGL is uh, by itself a large state machine, a collection of variables that define how OpenGL should currently operate. The state of OpenGL is commonly referred to as the OpenGL context. When using OpenGL, we often change its state by setting some options, manipulating some buffers, and then render it using the current context. Whenever we tell OpenGL that we now want to draw lines instead of triangles, for example, we change the state of OpenGL by changing some context variable that sets how OpenGL should draw. As soon as we change the context by telling OpenGL it should draw lines, the next drawing commands will now draw lines instead of triangles. Okay, that makes sense. When working in OpenGL, we will come across several state changing functions that change the context and several state using functions that perform some operations based on the current state of OpenGL. As long as you keep in mind that OpenGL is basically one large state machine, most of its functionality make more sense. Okay, I mean, sure. <clears throat> the OpenGL libraries are written in C and allows for many derivations in other languages. Since many of C's language constructs do not translate that well to other higher level languages, uh, OpenGL was developed with several abstractions in mind. One of those abstractions are objects in OpenGL. Uh, an object is a collection of options that represents a subset of OpenGL's state. For example, we can have an object that represents the settings of the drawing window. We could then uh, set its size, how many colors it supports, and so on. Uh, you could visualize it as a C-like struct, so float option, yeah, yeah okay, sure. Whenever we want to use objects, it generally looks something like this, but OpenGL's context visualizes as a large struct. Okay, OpenGL's context is a struct, object name, this is the pointer to object name. 
whatever type of object it is, object window target, okay? And then we have an unsigned integer, object ID. Uh, this is GL, which is the graphics library, right? Uh, generate object. I don't know what the one is, but you're generating the object ID. Are you giving it the, is the memory address of object ID? Okay. And then you're binding the object to the window, right? The window target is, uh, yeah, sure. You're binding the object to the window. You're making the window 800 pixels wide, making the 600 pixels high, sure. And then I don't know what the target means, but we'll first create an object and store reference to it as an ID. This is. The real world's object data is stored behind the scenes. We then bind the object using its ID, which is here, um, to the target location of the context. The location of the examples windows object is defined as geo window target. Okay, so that's what this is. Oh, and this generates the object itself, but that's us storing the reference to it, okay? Next, we set the window options, and finally, we'll unbind the object by setting the current ID. Um, Object ID of the window target to zero. Oh, because here we're binding the window target to object ID. Here we're binding it to zero, which effectively unbinds. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay. Cool. So additional resources, OpenGL, yada yada. So it seems on reading mode, I can't. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me read through the instruction real quick. Did I? Getting started, creating a window. Okay, let's read through this. So the first thing we need to do before creating stunning graphics is create an OpenGL context in an application window to draw in. However, these operations are a specific property system and OpenGL purposely tries to abstract itself. Great. Um, luckily, there are quite a few libraries out there that provide the functionality you seek, some specifically aimed at OpenGL. Those libraries save us all the operation system specific work and give us a window and an OpenGL context to render in. Um, okay, we're gonna be using GL, GLFW. Okay. The focus of this in the next chapter is get GLFW up and running, making sure it can properly create an OpenGL context. Great. We're gonna use Visual Studio 2019, which is, that's what I'm using, so great. Um, cool, so we need to obtain it from their website's download page. Uh, do we want the source package? Uh, it already has pre-compiled binaries and editor files for Visual Studio, but for completeness sake, we want to compile it from ourselves from the source code. Um, okay, so let's download the source package. Sure. Um, we'll be building all libraries to 64-bit binaries to make sure to get the 64-bit binaries if using the pre-compiled. Um, so extract it and open its content. Great. Let's do that real quick. Okay, so we've got something. Let me move this over. Great. Um, we're going to sit in a few items, the resulting library from compilation and the include folder. Okay. Compiling the library from source code guarantees that the resulting library is perfectly tailored to your CPU slash operating system. A luxury pre-compiled binaries don't always provide. Um, the problem with providing source code to the open world, however, is not everyone uses the say, excuse me, IDE or build system for developing, which means their project solution files may not be compatible with other people's setup. Okay, so this is why CMake exists. Um, we need to download and install CMake. Oh, jeez. If I know we were doing this tutorial faster, I would have done this quicker, so I apologize. All right, how do I download CMake? Oh, I was on the page. Uh, I can just get the binary, right? I don't have to do. Windows 64 installer. Okay. I don't think I have CMake at all. I have it on MSYS, but I think it should be fine. Okay, let's run this real quick. Oh, 
Yes, dev environment setup, baby. Um, yeah, I think we're going to add it to the path, right? Probably. I would think I'd want to add it to the path. I don't know why I wouldn't. Truly, I streamed on Sunday, which was about like four days ago, but my throat is already like, why are you talking this much again? <clears throat> it's rough. All right, so we downloaded CMake. Great. Did that work? Do I have CMake? Oh, I have a CMake GUI. Great. CMake requires a source code folder and a destination folder for the binaries. For the source code folder, we're going to choose the root folder of GLFW source package. So that's my downloads folder, GLFW. Okay, it's just here. And then uh, for the build folder, we're creating a new directory build and then selecting that directory. Oh, should I put this in my C drive? Okay, maybe I should actually put this in my C drive instead of just in my downloads. That would perhaps be smart. Okay, browse source, so now it's just here. And GLFW. Great, and then we go browse build is in here. Make a new folder called build. Select the folder. Great, uh, once the source and destination folders have been set, click configure. Uh, select the generator for this project. I guess it's Visual Studio 16, yeah, 2019. Uh, optional platform, optional tool set. Use default native compilers. Yeah, sure. Um, once the settings have been set, we click generate. Uh, and the resulting files will be placed in your build folder. Generating done. Okay, did that work? Let's find out. Oh, nice, it worked, cool. All right, so in the build, we get a uh, file named glfw.sln, and we can open it with Visual Studio 19. Always open it with that, great. Oh, that's gonna open it in a big ass window. Jeez, Visual Studio is a behemoth to open. Yikes. Okay, so that's my window real quick. Great. Um, since CMake generated a project file, we only have to build the solution. Um, great, now hit build solution. Build solution is F7. I'll remember that for next time. All right, let's hope this works. <laughs> Build succeeded. 32 succeeded, two skipped, great. Um, CMake should have automatically configured, okay, great. This will give us a compiled library file that can be found in build, src, debug, glfw3.lib. Okay, so we find the lib and include folders, the ID compiler, and add the content of the include folder to the ID's include folder, okay. Is to create a new set of directories at a location of your choice that contains all the header files library from third-party libraries which you can refer to. Okay. What do they recommend? Creating a new set of directories at a location of your choice that contains all the header files slash libraries from third-party libraries, which you can refer to from your IDE compiler. You could, for instance, create a single folder that contains a libs and include folder, or restore uh, all our library and header files respectively for OpenGL projects. Now all the third-party libraries are organized within a single location that can be shared across multiple computers. The requirement is however that each time we create a new project, we have to tell the IDE where to find those directories. Okay, so that seems fine to me. So we can just make a folder here that just says, let's make, uh, just say CPP. And then we have, 
include and then they capitalize things when I want to do that. Libs. Yo, what's going on, Dylan? C++ <laughs> Visual Studio makes my computer go burr. So then I need to copy things over from here, presumably. So I guess I copy this. I might have to copy the folders inside of there. We bring those out, but we'll see, I guess. How are you doing tonight, Don? How's it going, dude? Uh, okay, so build and then This is the actual library file. Okay. Once the required files are stored at the location of your choice, we can start creating our first project. Great. Uh, doing fine, you a productive by body someone to sleep. That's how you just drink caffeine, friend. Okay, uh, let's open up a new, okay, so it's saying to create a new project, which I'm going to do because I made another uh, wait, do I want to save changes? No, don't save. Let's open Visual Studio 2018. Uh, okay, we're going to create a new project. Select MPC++ project. Right. Don't forget your project is suitable name. Uh, since we're doing everything in 64-bit, you need to change that. Okay, let's change this. Open GL. Great. Cool, we have a project. Uh, okay, we're gonna change this to 64-bit. Awesome. All right, so in order for the project to use GLFW, we'll need to link the library with our project. Um, this can be my specify, we wanna use that library and linker settings, but our project does not you know where to find it. Okay, so we need to right click the project name. Um, and then go to VCC directory, wait, oh, properties, Visual C++ directories, library directories. Okay, from there on out, you can add your own directories. Uh, this can be done by manually inserting the text or by clicking the appropriate location string and selecting the edit button. Great. So now, Okay, uh, new line, so this is C, uh, CPP, this is library directories, so I put libs, I have to own the libs. What's going on, Duncan? I agree though, yeah, sleeping is actually the right decision, I'm just bad at encouraging that. Okay, and then also include directories, right, is the other one. So here we do C, CPP, uh, include. All right, we hit apply. You can add as many extra directories as you want. You'll be able to find all the header files to GLFW by including GLFW. The same applies to the library directories. Um, so I can, I can find all the fi required files. We can finally link GLFW to the project by going to the linker tab and input. And then additional dependencies. Um, by manually or adding, adding edit. And then additional dependencies. This is called GL, G, God dang it. <laughs> glfw3.lib. It's not in here already? Oh god, okay, it's on M1. Ah! And from that point on, glfw link to be compiled. In addition to GL glfw, we should also uh, add a link entry to the OpenGL library, but this may differ for operating system. So if you're on Windows, um, 
let's do this. Edit. Uh, the library open gl32.lib comes the SDK. Okay. And what else, what else did they change? Ignore specific default libraries? What is that? If I get it, make a project suggestion, recreating the first level of Super Mario 1 or something similar. It might not be glamorous, but it certainly is achievable. Ooh, that would be really interesting. Yeah, so first I'm gonna, since we're doing everything from scratch, I have to learn probably a lot before we get to that point. So right now, the first step is learning graphics programming. So I can draw some fucking squares on the goddamn screen. But I agree, that would be fun, actually. Um, a Discord I'm in that talks about this, someone had asked about this today, about, like, what beginner projects they could start with. And they had some good uh, suggestions, actually. Um, they said any sort of 2D game, so, like, uh, Tetris, um, or uh, I forget how Breakout works, but that's, like, the ball bouncy thing game. Um, someone mentioned a Minecraft-like game if you get into 3D graphics. Um... Or like Pong or something, which is, these are all good ideas. So we can do something simple. And like I said, I like don't have, you know, a, a good game idea or anything. So um, I'm truly fine with doing a bunch of like random projects for now until I learn things. Yeah, Pong would be kind of cool actually. <clears throat> okay, so, um, Okay, I think this is correct. So once you've added both of them, so let's go ahead and apply, hit okay. Um, you can include the header files for GLFW as follows. Wait, what? Okay, so I don't actually know how to tell whether or not this works yet, but I guess we'll get there. So we're still not quite there yet since there's only there is one other thing we still need to do. Because OpenGL is really only a standard or specification, excuse me, uh, it is up to the driver manufacturer to implement the specification to a driver that the specific graphics card supports. Um, since there are many different versions of OpenGL drivers, the location of most of its functions is not known at compile time. It needs to be queried at runtime. It is then the task of the developer to retrieve the location of the functions that they need uh, and store them in function pointers for later use. Retrieving those function locations is OS specific. Okay, so this is like a function I have to place. Thankfully, there are libraries for this purpose as well as where GLAD is popular. Okay, so. You have to do this, but now we're gonna do it, get a library to do it. Okay, that's fine. Um, so Glad is a slightly different configuration set up the most common open source libraries. It uses a web service where we can tell Glad for which version of OpenGL we'd like to define and load all relevant functions according to that version. So go to the Glad web service. Make sure the language is set to C++. Um, and then select OpenGL version of at least 3.3. 3.3, right? I think is what we wanted to go. And in the API section, select an open... Okay, great. Um, also make sure the profile is set to core. Okay. And that generate a loader option is ticked. Great. Uh, ignore the extensions for now and click generate to produce the resulting library files. Oh, wow, this just does it. These files are not permanent, okay. Should give you a zip file containing two include folders and a single glad.c folder. Okay, let's go ahead and save this. Let's go ahead and open this up. See what this looks like.
two include folders and a single SRC. Oh yeah, I mean, that's basically what it's saying. Copy both include folders, glad and khr into your includes directory. Okay. It's here, oh God, cpp include. Um, and add the glad.c file to your project. Okay. So my downloads, glad. How do I add it to my project? I just drag it in there, I guess. Hello, cat. Open my door. Foils me again. Hello? Oh, hello. I'm your stuff in here now, but sorry. Oh, I just pet him. No, he's gonna fucking hop on my lap. God damn it. No. Go away. All right. Um. After the previous steps, you should be able to add the following include directory above your file. Wait, hold on. When did I make a new file? <laughs> did it tell me to do this and I just missed it? Did I miss something? Fur babies. Yeah, something like that. Fuck, wait, what? What's this? Am I just. I know it told me to make a new project. Did it tell me to make a file? Did I just miss that? Create empty project? Yeah, it doesn't really tell me to make a file. I don't think. Okay, well, that's fine. Alright. I am bummed that I can't advance the next page on the reading mode, but that's fine. Um, okay, so let's see if we can get it up and running. Here, let's close out of this for now. First, create a CPP file and add the following includes to the top of your newly created file. Okay, so I want to make a new add new item CPP file. Let's call it source.cpp, sure. All right, now we need to add our includes. Include glad, glad h. Oh, I there we go. That worked, that's good, it's a good sign. Include uh, GLFW, yep. And what am I doing here? Uh, GLFWH, oh my God, it worked, yes. That's exciting. All right, um, be sure to include GLAD before GLFW, great, we did that. Next, let's make the main function where we instantiate the GLFW window, okay. So int main, I'm not doing KNR style braces. Sorry. I mean, I, I will, I actually don't mind that much, but you know. All right, so we just init the window, that's all this does. Initializes the GLFW library. This function initializes the library. Before most functions can be used, must be initialized. Um, before an application terminate, terminates, it should be terminated in order to free any resources allocated during or after initialization. This function fails, it calls something. It returns a string if it was successful or not. That's kind of weird. Mm. That's not a string, that's a, a constant, so because it returns an int. Okay, so what is this? GLFW window hint. What does that do? Sets the specified window hint to the desired value. What is a window hint? Is that like when you mouse? Is that the name of the window? I actually don't know what a window hint is referring to here. What 
What are hints? Are they just like settings? Okay, I don't know why they're calling them hints. That seems a little weird, but whatever, I guess. Okay, so anyways, let's just go over this. So G, L, F, W, we're using a constant here. Um, context. A context version major. Three. Oh, because this is the open GL version we're using. And then GLFW window hints. Um, GLFW version minor, I assume we have to set. On text version minor. And we're using 3.3, .3, which is why I'm putting this in. Uh, and then the other thing is we need to set the OpenGL profile. Uh, GLFW OpenGL. OpenGL profile, and then we're setting that equal to GLFW OpenGL um, core profile. Okay, and then we return zero because we have to have a return type here. <clears throat> Great. Um, so the main function will first initialize it with GLFW init. Oh, sorry, let me make this. Uh, How do I? Uh, friends, how do I zoom? Uh, Visual Studio 2019 increase text size. Change editor fonts and colors. Tools, options, fonts and colors. I want to make this a little bigger, so hopefully it's a little easier to see. Uh, let's have to like size 13. That looks better. Uh, we can go ahead and make this a little smaller too. I don't think it seems to be huge. Great. Okay, this is better, I think. Let me know if that's like too hard to see still. Um, hopefully that's better. So, uh, the main function we first initialize it with GLFW in it. Uh, after which we can configure GLFW using the window hints. Okay, yeah, so hints just, I guess, are settings in this case. I thought window hint meant, like, you know, the thing that you get when you mouse over a window or something, but that's not the case. It just seems to be configuration. Um, so we tell it, so we give it the hint and then the value. So in this case, we're setting our major version to 3, our minor version to 3, because we're using OpenGL 3.3, uh, and then we're setting the profile equal to the core profile. Um, you can find all the possible options in the window handling documentation if I need it. Sure. Um, I don't think we'll... I guess we can take a glance at that real quick. Um, the following hints are always hard constraints. Stereo. Okay, where are they? Stereoscopic rendering. Desired number of samples. Okay, so just like a bunch of stuff. Brain buffer related hints. Okay, so this is a good thing to know. Um, since the focus of this book is on OpenGL version 3.3, we'd like to tell GLFW 3.3 is the version we want to use. Great. <clears throat> okay. Um, telling it we want to use the core profile means we'll get access to a smaller subset of OpenGL features without backwards compatible features we no longer need. Nothing on Mac OS X, so if you need to do whatever. So make sure you have OpenGL version 3.3 higher installed. Okay. I'll use a utility like OpenGL extension viewer. Do I have that? OpenGL. God. I'm going to install so many random things. Oh God, I forgot download.com existed, dude. What an unfortunate website. It used to be so good and now it's fucking terrible. Okay, so you know 102 megabytes, it's fine. Let's run it. 
All right, let's find out about my graphics render. Hopefully none of this is sensitive information. I don't think. All right, well, this is querying. I'm gonna go get some water because this might take a second and I also need, I need some more water. So I'll be back in just a minute. All right, I'm back. I have more Wawa. Ah, oh, great. So here's my computer specs, and it's yelling at me because I have uh, I have new drivers and I have not updated them. That's true. That is true. Um, okay, so I have 4.6 of OpenGL. So I need to have. Uh, if your sport version is lower, okay, so it looks like if it's a higher one, then it's fine. All right, cool. Next, we're required to create a window object. Oh, we didn't do that. We just initialized it. All right. The window object holds uh, all of the windowing data. <laughs> sure. And is required by most of GLFW's other functions. So the type of this variable is a GLFW window. Oh, it's cap uh, well, okay, W. We're making a pointer to that. Uh, we're making a window, and that's gonna be equal to the function glfw create window. Great. Why is that starred? I don't know if you saw that. glfw, yeah, like why is this? Oh, and telecode suggestion based on this context. What the fuck? It knows I'm gonna create a window? That's kind of wild. All right. I don't really think I need that, but that's kind of cool. Um, okay, so I have to specify some options here. I have to specify a width, a height, uh, a title, uh, and then a monitor, and then I don't know what a share is. The window whose context to share resources with or null to not share resources. What's the monitor, same thing? The monitor to use for full screen mode or null for windowed mode. Okay, cool. Um, so let's make it 800 by 600. Uh, this is the title of it. Cool, open GL, and then null, null. Why did it make a second one? And then if uh, window is equal to null, which means I guess something went wrong, um, then we are going to log that. Uh, so I'm gonna need to, we need to include IO stream from here, right? Hopefully the window won't get failed to get created, but you know. Then we, that happens, we go ahead and terminate. Which, does that take any parameters? Nope, just destroys all the windows. Okay, and then we return negative one. Uh, that's 
the wrong key, which is a failure. Otherwise, we're gonna go ahead and do GLFW uh, make, make content, what, it knows, holy shit. Is it scanning people's code? How does this work? It's Visual Studio Magic, man. All right. Uh, so we set the so it makes the context of the specified window current for the calling thread. A context must only be made current on a single thread at a time, and each thread may only have a single current context. Okay. I don't exactly understand what that's doing, but it's just making. I don't understand like the deep technical explanation of what that's doing there, but. All right, so the GLFW create window function requires the window width and height as its first two argument. Uh, the third argument allows us to create a name for the window. For now, we'll call it learn open GL, but you're allowed to name it however I want. That's true, I did, I knew it was something cool. Um, uh, we can ignore the last two parameters. The function returns the GLFW window object that we'll need later for other GLFW operations. Uh, after that, we tell GLFW to make the context of our window the main context for the main context on the current thread. So I mentioned glad manages function pointers. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and initialize glad before we call any open jail function. So um, let's go ahead and do this part. <clears throat> so this is if not, uh, this is glad load gl loader, right? Right, and then parentheses, and then we're casting this as glad load proc okay and we're casting the value of glfw get proc address and i assumed that need a oh sorry that should not be a function that's just is that a Is this just a, oh, it's a function type and then it applies it, I guess? I didn't realize C++ could have uh, partial functions. Huh. Weird, all right. Ah! Great, so if that's not the case, so I assume this is, uh, again, error. Yeah, failed to initialize glad. I hope these don't happen because then I'm gonna have to go through some really silly troubleshooting. CD and L. Um, again, we returned negative one because that's the standard uh, exit, bad exit error grid. Cool. We pointed to the address open GL function pointer, which is OS specific, um, gives us GLFW get proc address that defines the current function. Uh, okay, before we can start rendering, we have to do one last thing. We have to tell OpenGL the size of the rendering window so OpenGL knows how we want to display the data. So we can set those dimensions via the GL viewport function. Okay, so this is different from the window object then, right? Because we already defined the window. I'm gonna leave a comment here. This is, this is, Okay, cool. So now we're setting up the um, init viewport. This is the OpenGL viewport. OpenGLHF. Uh, I want. Okay, so I just set those dimensions via the GL viewport. So the GL viewport is the X, so we're gonna say, so the X and Y are the, okay, it's based on lower left, okay. So we started zero, zero, and then 800, 600. So really we should have, what would be smart here is that we initial, or, um, how do I do const again in C++? Okay, so we can do const int uh, window uh, 
with. I was like, can cons not have underscores in them? Window width is 800, not 8,000. And then cons in window height is 800 or 600 really. It seems silly to have these as magic numbers in two different places when if you want to change one, you probably want to change the other, right? That's why we're doing this real quick. In case I want to mess around too and make the windows bigger, then you know, be able to do that relatively easy. Right. Great. Um, okay, that's a quick change to do real quick. And then... Okay, yeah, so we can make the OpenGL smaller and then we can display other things outside of the viewport. Okay, that's fine. We don't want to do that though. So behind the scenes, OpenGL uses the data specified via GL viewport um, to transform the 2D coordinates of process to coordinates on your screen. For example, our process point of location, negative uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, would at its final transformation be mapped to 200 slash 415 screen coordinates. Note that process coordinates in OpenGL are between negative 1 and 1, so we effectively map from the range negative 1 to 1 to 0 to 800 and 0 to 600. Uh, however, the moment a user resizes the window, the viewport should be adjusted as well. We can register a callback function on the window that gets called each time the window is resized. This resize callback function has the following prototype. Void frame buffer size callback, GLFW window uh, with height. So the frame, bus frame buffer size function takes the GLFW window as its first argument and the two integers indicating the new window dimensions. Whenever the window changes in size, uh, it calls it and fills the proper arguments. So we need to make this function outside of our main, I believe. Frame buffer, size, callback. Uh, again, the function signature here is glfw window, um, window int width int height. And then go ahead and set gl view port um, to zero, zero with And then we need to tell GLFW that we want that callback to register, right? Cause you can't just have it there. Um, and this is gonna be G um, set uh, resize callback. It's basically like we're in JavaScript and I'm writing in on resize event handler. It's the exact same thing. Great, so GLFW set frame buffer size callback. And then this is window. So we get the window object and the callback. Okay. Cool, so now it'll get called and uh, okay, yeah, I'm not on a red display, so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, there are many callback functions we can set to register our own functions. For example, we can make a callback function to process joystick input changes, process error messages, etc. We register the callback functions after we've created the window and before the render loop is initiated. So we haven't initiated the render loop yet. <clears throat> so we don't want the application to draw a single image and then immediately quit and close the window. We want the application to keep drawing images and handling user input until the program has been explicitly told to stop. Great, so we're going to create a while loop that we can now call the render loop that keeps running until we tell GLFW to stop. Oh, so it's literally a loop. Okay, that makes sense. So while um, not GLFW window should close on window. So while that's not the case, then we go ahead and render it with by doing GLFW swap buffers which swaps the front and back buffers of the specified window. 
Okay, I don't know what that means. But that's fine. And then you have to have poll events. Process is all pending events. This function processes only those events that are already in the event queue. Okay, so it literally does have like an event handler system. Neat. So this isn't quite from scratch, to be fair, but <laughs> GLFW it seems like it's doing some pretty uh, pretty heavy lifting here. Am I still like really fucking bright? It really feels like. Let me turn my light down a little bit. Now it's like doing nothing. Getting lights hard. Okay, so the GeoFund new window should close function checks the start of each loop iteration if it's been instructed to close. So if so, it's gonna return true and the runner loop stops and then the application will return. The pull events function checks to see if any events are triggered like keyboard input or mouse movement events. Updates the window state and calls the corresponding functions. The GLFW swap buffers will swap the color buffer, which is a large 2D buffer that contains color values um, that is used to render during this run iteration and show it as an output to the screen. Okay. So when an application draws in a single buffer, the resulting image may display filtering issues. This is because the resulting output image is not drawn in an instant, but drawn pixel by pixel. Oh, okay, so it's gonna draw, and then the other one sort of draws over. To circumvent it, uh, it applies a double buffer. So the front buffer contains the final image, uh, while the rendering commands draw to the back buffer, and as soon as the rendering commands... Oh, okay, that's really interesting, actually. So it finishes the draw before bringing it to the front. Okay, and that's what the swap buffer does. That's really neat, actually. God dang it. All right, one last thing. As soon as we exit the render loop, we would like to properly clean slash delete all of GFW's resources that were allocated. We can do this via the GLF GFW terminate function that we call at the end of the main function. And we uh, called that here. Shouldn't we also call it here though, if glad fails initialize? I think that's actually kind of an oversight. <clears throat> I'm like pretty sure because you're exiting the program, right? So I think that's correct there. Now try to compile your application. If everything well, you should see the following output, which is a fucking black screen. All right, so it's Control F5. There were build errors. Fuck. So, unresolved to turn assemble glad load geoloader referenced in function main. Okay, so let me, if I build, if I right click build, is that. No, it still failed. Um, okay, if you didn't get the right image or you're confused with everything that fits together, if you have issues compiling, first make sure all your linker options are set correctly and you properly included the right directors in your IDE. Okay, so let's compare with the full force, full source code first. Let's do that first. Include glad, glad h, glfw, glfw8, 3.h. Void frame buffer size. Uh, we haven't done this process input, right? We did not configure that. I don't think I have to have a, I think I can just declare the thing. Okay, so you put these out of here. This is all pretty small things, but, and then I made them unsigned in. Which makes sense. We don't ever want those values to be negative. Okay, so GLFW init, uh, version major three, three, great. So it's actually not gonna be issued with my source code, right, though, because it's a linker error. It says it's a linker error. Yeah, two unresolved externals. Unresolved external symbol glad load GL loader. 
And then also it doesn't like GL viewport. Okay, so why does it not like that? External dependencies. I have glide.h in here. Okay. So let's go back up to the section where we talked about linkers. Um, okay, create, let's go back to creating a window. Let's go read through this again. So building GLFW, we already did that. So again, I don't think GLFW is the issue. It seems like it's more mad about Glad. Great, so I set up Glad, I downloaded it. So you need to copy both include folders, Glad and KHR into the include thing here, which I have glad and I have KHR. Right. Um, your includes directory or add an extra item pointing to these folders and then the add the glad.c file to your project. So I assume it went in the right place. It went into external dependencies. Is that correct? Include glad, glad.h. It gave me a glad.c file. Oh, this is glad.h. Where's glad.c? References? What is that? Yeah, where did that glad thing go? Okay, well, apparently it didn't get added, so that's probably why. All right, uh, so this is in here. We have glad, src, glad.c. So I added it to source files. Hopefully that helps. How do I build again? Okay, that succeeded. Uh, and then we need to run. Let's just do local windows debugger. Oh, fuck yeah, baby. That's a... Oh, wait, what? Oh, okay, this is our debug window. Here's our fucking window. Hell yeah. That's a fucking window, and then it resizes and shit. Dude, fuck yeah. <laughs> All right, let's, let's draw something to this dang window, because there's nothing here. Okay, now what are we doing? Uh, now we're doing input, okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and just, uh, how do I stop? close it yeah okay cool awesome fuck yeah um great so we also want to process input so let's go ahead and process input um close out of that we only want to edit first let's uh edit void oh, no void void process input ulfw window start at window And then if glfw get key window, so what does the get key do? Returns the last reported state of a keyboard key for the specified window. Um, return is either pressed or released. And then the repeat might be to the callback, okay? Um, so then we're looking for glfw key, and you can apparently specify any key. And we're doing escape. So if the, the state of that is GLFW press, which that evaluates to right, some to one. Okay. So if we're pressing escape, um, then we do oh we're closing the window. Okay, so GLFW set window should close. Uh, sets the close flag. This function sets away the close flag. Uh, this can be used to override the user's attempt to close the window or to signal that it should be closed. So it doesn't actually close it directly. It just tells it, hey, you need to close on the next light cycle or whatever. Great. Um, okay, if it's not pressed, when it returns release. If the user did press it, we close GLFW by setting the close property to true. 
And then the next condition, check the main while loop, again down here. Uh, if it should be closed, then it will stop. We then call process input every iteration of the render loop. <coughs> Excuse me, jeez. Now we call process input on the window. Oh, I don't want it at all. This gives us an easy way to check for specific key presses and react accordingly every frame. An iteration of the render loop is more commonly referred to as a frame. Oh, it all makes sense now. So we get frames per second. Big thunk. Uh, okay, so we're gonna place all the rendering commands in the render loop. Um, great, so if we have to do stuff, then we put it there. Excuse me. Okay, so just to test, te test if things actually work, we're gonna clear the screen with the color of our choice. At the start of a frame, we want to clear the screen. Otherwise, we would still see the results from the previous frame. This could be the effect you're looking for, but usually you don't. We can clear the screen's color buffer by using GL clear when we pass in buffer bits to specify which buffer we'd like to clear. The possible bits we can set are GL color buffer bit, GL depth buffer bit, and GL stencil buffer bit. Right now, we only care about the color values, so we, we only clear the color buffer. So we're doing GL clear color. Oh, and you can tell, look, this is actually a, this looks like the actual function name here. So we're doing 0.2F, uh, the float, which is the red. 0.3F green is 0.3F uh, blue, and then the alpha is 1.0 for full, full transfer, or er, full opaqueness. Right? Yeah, that's correct. And then we run GL clear, uh, which is GL color buffer bit. So I guess the clear color set this buffer bit. And then we're, yeah, telling that's it. All right, so note that we also specify the color to clear the screen, it's using GL clear color. Whenever we call GL clear and clear the color buffer, the entire color buffer will be filled with a color as configured by the clear color. This will result in a dark green bluish color. As you may recall from the OpenGL chapter, the, the GL clear color function is the state setting function and GL clear is the state using function. Oh, so this sets the current state of the GL object. Again, it's a state machine. And then this says, okay, check that state and use it. Okay. It's kind of confusing in some ways because is it hard to tell the current state of the GL, the OpenGL object? And it seems like it, but I guess maybe we'll get to that. Great, so let's go ahead and build it. Uh, build and run, I believe, is again, uh, control F5. Oh, fuck yeah, that's a different color. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, okay, cool, let's do some actual graphics. This is exciting and I'm glad we have a color, but this is not really anything notable. Press any key equals one there. All right, next chapter. Ooh, hello triangle, yep, sure. So in OpenGL, everything is in 3D space, but the screen or window is a 2D array of pixels. So a large part of OpenGL's work is about transforming all 3D coordinates into 2D pixels to fit on your screen. The process of transforming 3D coordinates to 2D pixels is managed by the graphics pipeline of OpenGL. Oh, fuck yeah, baby, this is where we get into math, which I never do anymore, so this will be fun. The graphics pipeline can be divided into two large parts. The first transforms your 3D coordinates into 2D coordinates, and the second tr part transforms the 2D coordinates into the actual colored pixels, okay? In this chapter, we'll briefly discuss the graphics pipeline and how we can use it to our advantage. Great. So it takes in as input a set of 3D coordinates and transforms them to colored 2D pixels. The pipeline can be divided into several steps. Uh, each requires the output of the previous step as its input. 
All these steps are highly specialized and they can be easily executed in parallel. Because of their parallel nature, graphics cards of today have thousands of small processing cores to quickly process your data within the graphics pipeline. The processing cores run small programs on the GPU for each step of the pipeline. These small programs are called shaders. Oh, okay. I'm like being enlightened right now, so much. Some of these shaders are configurable by the developer, which allows us to write our own shaders to replace the existing default shaders. This gives us much more fine-grained control over specific parts of the pipeline, and because they run in the GPU, they can also save us valuable CPU time. Shaders are written in the OpenGL shading language, GLSL, and we'll delve into that more in the next chapter. So before, below you find an abstract representation. Okay, so here's a triangle. The blue sections represent sections where we can inject our own shaders. So we have a vertex shader, a shape assembly, geometry shader, rasterization, fragment shader, and then tests and blending, okay? And we can have our own shaders on the vertex, the geometry, and the fragment. Because again, these are the shader sections, yeah, okay? So as you can see, it contains a large number of sections that each handle one specific part of converting your vertex data into a fully rendered pixel. I uh, will briefly explain each part of the pipeline in a simplified way. Great, actually, let me go turn on my overhead light to see if that helps with my shininess. The lighting in my room is kind of booty and this light square helps, but you know, it's not perfect. Need a better setup for sure. <clears throat> Great, so as input to the graphics pipeline, we pass in a list of three 3D coordinates that should form a triangle in an array here called vertex data. This vertex data is a collection of vertices. A vertex is a collection of data per 3D coordinate. Yep, okay, sure. So this vertex data is represented using vertex attributes that contain any data we want. But for simplicity's sake, let's just assume each vertex consists of a 3D position and some color value. So an X, Y, and Z in a color, okay? Um, in order for OpenGL to know what to make of your collection of coordinates, Woo, my poor throat. Um, OpenGL requires you to hint what kind of render types you want to form with the data. Do we want the data rendered as a collection of points, a collection of triangles, or perhaps just one long line? Those hints are called primitives and are given to OpenGL while calling any of the drawing commands. Some of these hints are GL points, GL triangles, and GL line strip, okay? GL... GL points, yeah. Go triangles, okay. The first part of the pipeline is the vertex shader that takes uh, as input a single vertex. Oh, that's not what I wanted. So the main purpose of the vertex shader is to transform 3D coordinates into different 3D coordinates, more on that later. And the vertex shader allows us to do some basic processing on the vertex attributes. Okay, so like, <laughs> yeah, this line does not make sense, but hopefully they'll explain that. Um, the primitive assembly stage takes as input all the vertices or vertex of geo points is chosen. From the vertex shader, it assembles all the points in the primitive shape given, in this case a triangle. The output of the primitive assembly stage is passed to the geometry shader. The geometry shader takes as input a collection of vertices that form a primitive and has the ability to generate other shapes by emitting new vertices to form new or other primitives. In an example case, it generates a second triangle. Okay. And then, so the output of the geometry shader, um, okay, so the output of the geometry shader is then passed on to the rasterization stage where it maps the resulting primitives to the corresponding pixels on the final screen, resulting in fragments for the fragment shader to use. Uh, clipping discards all fragments that are outside your view, increasing performance. Okay. A fragment in OpenGL is all the data required for OpenGL to render a single pixel. The main purpose of the fragment shader is to calculate the final color of a pixel and is usually the stage where all the advanced OpenGL effects occur. Usually the fragment shader contains data about the 3D scene that can use to calculate the final pixel color, like lights, oh, like shadows. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. After all the corresponding color values have been determined, the final object will then pass through one more stage. Sorry about that. Um, we call the alpha test and blending stage. This checks the corresponding depth and stencil value, we'll get to those later, of the fragment and uses those to check if the resulting fragment is in front or behind other objects and should be discarded accordingly. 
Oh, okay. And then it calculates opacity and blends accordingly. The graphics pipeline is quite a complex hole and contains many configurable parts. However, for almost all cases, we only have to work with the vertex and fragment shader, which are the, what? Here and here, okay? The geometry shader is optional, is usually left to its default shader. Ooh. Ooh, excuse me. There is also the tessellation stage and transform feedback loop that we haven't depicted here, but that's something for later. Sure. So in modern OpenGL, we are required to define at least a vertex and fragment shader of our own. There is no default one. For this reason, it is often quite difficult to start running modern OpenGL since a great deal of knowledge is required before being able to draw your first triangle. <laughs> great. Oh yeah, oh my god, this section's really long. Holy shit. Alright, so first we have to give it some vertex data. Yep, so X, Y, and Z coordinates. Um, okay, OpenGL only processes 3D coordinates when they're in a specific range between negative 1.0 and 1.0 on all three axes. All coordinates within this range, uh, within this so called normalized device coordinates range, will end up visible on your screen. Okay. Because we want to render a single triangle, we want to specify a total of three vertices with each vertex having a 3D position. We define them in normalized device coordinates, uh, the visible region of OpenGL, in a float array. So I didn't know you could initialize the float with these curly braces. So let's make this. Uh, vertices, and then again we're supposed to find it's an array, and then we're going to go ahead and initialize it. So this is three points, right? F, uh, 0.0 F, 0.5 F, negative 0.5 F, and I, do I have to put the F because it's a float, is that? Uh, oh, okay, I did that right, I was like, I was like, that's not correct if those are both negative. And then this one's gonna be both positive. And I don't know if it's actually smart to have this in the render loop because then we're reinitializing this every time. But we'll check the final source code at the end to see if that's correct. But I have a hunch. It's it seems not great to initialize a whole variable like this every time you render because you're doing this a lot. <laughs> um, okay, so we render a 2D triangle with each vertex having a Z coordinate of zero. So once your vertex coordinates have been processed in the vertex shader, there should be normalized device coordinates, which is a small space for the X, Y, and Z values from negative one to one. Any coordinates that fall outside this range will be discarded slash clipped and you will be visible on your screen. But you can see the triangle we specified <sighs> within the normal normalized device coordinates. Okay, great. So, yep, let's start triangle. Fuck yeah. So the zero, zero coordinates are at the center of the graph instead of the top left. So on the screen, zero, zero is like here, which makes sense, right? But on here, this is like an actual XY graph. <laughs> and so OpenGL is going to do the work of translating this for us to the actual pixels on the screen, from what I understand. Um, so cool. So eventually you want all the transform coordinates to end up at this coordinate space, otherwise they won't be visible. Your NDC coordinates will then be transformed to screen space coordinates with the, uh, via the viewport transform using the data you provided with GL viewport. Okay. And I bet you that math isn't terrible, right? Because it's just doing... Can I peek the definition? I don't know how to find it. It's not actually important. Oh, it'd be in glide.c also. <laughs> not in the header file. All right, um, so the resulting screen space coordinates are then transformed to fragments as inputs your fragment shader. 
With the vertex data defined, we'd like to send it as input to the first process of the graphics pipeline, vertex shader. This is done by creating memory on the GPU where we store the vertex data, configure how OpenGL should interpret the memory, and specify how to send the data to the graphics card. And then it processes the vertices, great. <laughs> So we manage this memory via so-called uh, vertex buffer objects, VBO. They can store a large number of vertices in the GPU's memory. The advantage of using those buffer objects is that we can send large batches of data all at once to the graphics card and keep it there if there's enough memory left without having to send data vertex one vertex at a time. Sending data to the graphics card from the CPU is relatively slow, so wherever we can try and send as much data as possible at once. Okay. Once the data is in the graphics card memory, the vertex shader has almost instant access to the vertices, making it extremely fast. That's why graphics cards have a lot of onboard memory, then. That makes sense. A vertex buffer object is our first occurrence of an OpenGL object, as we discussed in the first chapter. Just like any object, it has a unique ID corresponding to the buffer, so we can generate one with the buffer ID using the GL gen buffers function. Uh, so I'm going to peek real quick. Let's scroll down real quick. All right, complete source code here. Do a window creation. Okay, yeah, so we're definitely doing all of this outside of the render loop. This is like a nice little, uh, nice little code viewer here. Okay, so we're definitely doing all of this outside the render loop. That's what I suspected, but I wanted to check before I started writing it. <clears throat> all right, so let me scroll back up to where we were, which was up here quite a bit. Okay, so the VBO again is the vertex buffer object. I'm gonna do unsigned uh, int VBO and then uh, GL gen buffers. Uh, the size is one, and then we're giving it the address of our VBO. OpenGL has many types of buffer objects, and the buffer type of a vertex buffer object is GL array buffer. GL, OpenGL allows us to bind to several buffers at once as long as they have a different buffer type. We can bind the newly created buffer to the GL buffer target uh, with the GL bind buffer function. So we've made the buffer with this, right? And then GL bind buffer. And then we're binding it to the GL, the array buffer here. And then we're binding the VBO to that. <clears throat> and we want to trouble typing VBO for some reason. So from that point on, any buffer calls we make on the GL array buffer target will be used to configure the currently bound buffer, which is VBO. Okay. We can then make a call to the GL buffer data function that copies the previously defined vertex data into the buffer's memory. GL buffer data. Um, this is GL array buffer size of vertices vertices and then GL static draw now what is static draw okay so GL buffer data is a function specifically targeted to copy user defined data into the currently bound buffer its first argument is the type of buffer we want to copy the data into so we just bound it to the GL array so that makes sense um, the second argument specifies the size of the data in bytes we want to pass to the buffer, which is the size of, of this array. Sure. The third parameter is the actual data we want to send. The fourth parameter specifies how we want the graphics card to manage the given data. This is a three forms. Stream draw, which is only set once and used by the GPO at most a few times. Static, which the set is only used once and used many times. Or dynamic, which is the data has changed a lot and used many times. Okay. Uh, the position data of the triangle does not change, is used a lot, and stays the same for every render call. So this usage type should best be static. 
If, for instance, one would have a buffer with data that's likely to change frequently, a usage type of geodynamic draw ensures the graphics server will place the data in memory that allows for faster rates. Okay, so this is just a, uh, a GPU optimization. So for our stuff, you know, this part doesn't matter right now, but it's good to know. Um, as of now, we stored the vertex data within memory on the graphics card as managed by a vertex buffer object named VBO. Next, we want to create a vertex and fragment shader that actually processes data. So let's start building those. Sure, shader's done. Um, the first thing we need to do is write the vertex shader in the shader language, which is GLSL, and then compile the shader so we can use it in our application. Below, we'll find the source code of a very basic vertex shader in GLSL. So it looks similar to C. So version 3.30, we're using the core, it's the profile, right? Layout location zero in vector three. I don't know what a pause is. And we've got a main function. Geo position is equal to a, is that a 4D vector? Wait, why is it vec four? It takes an X, a Y, a Z, and an alpha, it looks like. Uh, we declare all the input vertex attributes in the vertex shader with the in keyword. So right now we only care about the position data, so we only need a single vertex attribute. GLSL is a vertex data type that contains one to four floats based on its postfix digit. Since each vertex has a 3D coordinate, we want to create a vector three input variable with the name a pause. Okay. We also specifically set the location of the input variable via layout. I sneeze. The answer is no, I will not sneeze. All right. Um, since each vertex is a 3D coordinate, we make it back three. Um, we also specify the location, specifically set the location of the input variable via layout, location equals zero. Um, and you'll see later why we're gonna need that location, okay? In graphics programming, uh, we often use the mathematical concept of vector quite often, since it neatly represents positions slash directions in any space and has useful mathematical properties. So it has a maximum size of four. Um, and in four, it gets X, Y, Z, and W. W is not used to position, but it's used for something called perspective division. We'll discuss vector, so it's, it's, not, uh, it's not an alpha, like I, I, I misspoke. A miss a miss guess there. Um, okay, so to set the output of the vertex shader, we have to assign the position data to the predefined GL position variable, which is a vector for behind the scenes. Okay. Since our input is the size of vector three, we have to cast this to a size four. Um, so we just insert it in there and then set the W to 1.0. Okay, and we'll explain why in a later chapter, sure. So the current vertex shader is probably the most simple vertex shader we can imagine because we did no processing whatsoever in the input data and simply forward it to the shader's output. In real applications, the input data is usually not already normalized device coordinates. Um, so first we have to transform the input data to coordinates that fall within open GL's physical region. Okay, sure. So now let's put it in there. So now we take the source code for the vertex shader and store it in a const C string. Oh, interesting. Okay, I'm not gonna type that. Oh, that was... That was command B. All right, so in order for OpenGL to use the shader, it has to dynamically compile it at runtime from its source code. The first thing we need to do is create a shader object, again, referenced by an ID, great. So we store the vertex shader as an unsigned int and then create the shader with GL create shader. So that'll go down here. This is our buffer. And then we've got uh, unsigned. All right, let's put this next to the VBO. Or, I guess it doesn't really matter, but uh, so this needs to have a semicolon at the end. So. On 
since I'm in vertex shader, and then vertex shader is equal to GL create shader. And then we give it GL vertex shader. Okay. So, and again, all this is doing is taking, if I'm reading this correctly, it's taking a, the input is this layout. So it's taking this as a vector. This is the position, it's a position. And then we're setting the GL position, which I guess is how the shader actually like returns the data. This is the output. Um, we're setting the position of the vector equal to a vector four, because this is a vector four under the hood. Um, so we're just adding a 1.0 W value to it. But otherwise it's just the position of the vector that we tell it to be at. Great. Um, cool, so we now attach the shader source code to the shader object and compile the shader. So GL shader source is going to be uh, vertex shader, which is the shader. The count, I guess it's just one shader. Oh, second argument tells us how many strings are passing in source code, which is just one. Third parameter is the actual source code of the vertex shader, uh, which should be vertex shader source. It's not there. <laughs> and then last parameter is glint that we're setting to null. You probably want to check if compilation was successful after the call to geo compile shader, and if not, what errors were found so you can fix those. Checking for compile time errors is accomplished as follows. Okay, so let's go ahead and we are missing a semicolon here, and then let's go ahead and save, and then we're running uh, control F5. Okay, I mean, that seemingly worked at runtime. Um, okay, so this is a check for compile time errors. So let's just read through this real quick, even though we don't have any. So you define a success variable, an info log, which is just a character array. Um, you get our vertex shader, you get the compile status, and you, you get the success. So if compilation failed, we should retrieve the error message with GL get shader info log <clears throat> and print the error message. Okay, that's good to know. All right, I have to go to the bathroom, so this feels like a good place to take a second. So I'm gonna get some more water, uh, run to the bathroom, I'll be back in a few minutes. Um, if you are not already and you are enjoying the stream, uh, make sure to follow on Twitch, you'll get notifications whenever I go live supports the stream all that good stuff um and we also have a community discord that you can join if you're interested in it's exclamation mark discord i'll get you the link to that um and yeah i'll be back in just a few minutes to take a quick bathroom break and get some more wawa and i'll be back all right friends sorry for the extended break ice cream was ordered oh my overlay's fucked on that ice cream is ordered so that's you know important um z i do not know say your name at all z zero u zero l thank you so much for the follow hope you enjoyed the stream hope you're having a good day what is up dan <clears throat> all right Ice cream, very important. I agree. I agree. Oh, all right. It's time. All right, fragment shader. It's the second and final shader we're going to create. Great. So we made our vertex shader. Now we're going to make our fragment shader. And the fragment shader, again, is in what part of the, the process here? The fragment shader is like doing the actual shadow drawing, essentially, right? You just got a fork? Oof. Well, welcome to the stream where I draw a bunch of fucking triangles. Right now we just have, oh, sorry, that's not what I want. Let's see me. I thought my window was open. It's not. Right now we just have a colored window. <laughs> but soon we will have a triangle. Um, okay, so we have our, our vertex shader, great. 
Yeah, it's CMake. I'm following the Learn OpenGL tutorial, and we compiled um, GLFW from source. So it's actually really easy. All right, we made the vertex shader. Let's make a comment that that's the vertex shader in it. Uh, <clears throat> Jeez. And then next is fragment shader in it. All right. Cool. So um, the fragment shader is it's about the calculating the color output of your pixels. To keep things simple, we're just going to always output an orangish color. Okay, so it's an array of four values, red, green, blue, and alpha. Sure. RGBA. Yep. We set the strength of each component to a value between 0 and 1. Um, great. Given those three components, you can generate 60 million colors. Great. So version 330 core, again, the same as that. So the output is a vector for frag color. Is that its output, right? That's what it's defining. Is it of type output? Because this one says layout, not output. Anyways, don't exactly know what that means, but. Um, we're calling it frag color, and then the frag color is equal to vector four again of this color it's giving us. So the process for compiling a fragment shader is similar to the vertex shader, although this time we use geo fragment shader constant as the shader type. Okay. Shader language is a bit weird, but yeah, basically output. Okay. The shader language is really odd, and I don't like it. I'm hoping that, I assume I have to write my own, so, or like, you know, I, obviously I'm writing my own. I assume I have to modify them somewhat. I'm hoping it's not too bad. Um, okay, so here we're gonna go ahead and do, um, oh, sorry, we're doing the initialization is down here. I have to take this and actually make it here. So cons, car, star, Car star. Uh, this is fragments shader source. So then I need to place this with new lines, new line characters. Oh wait, what are they doing? They're doing core and then slash n and then wait you can how does that what is the syntax actually i just noticed that what weird syntax you can use a car star or you can read the shaders from a text file so you don't have to do a shit ton of slash ends oh is that hard that sounds better that sounds much better actually than this Seen like here, why do I have to do fucking... See, like, this is why you shouldn't use KNR style braces, because then I have to do fucking extra work. Like, I'm just not... Just not gonna do that. And I don't think indentation matters either. Yeah, it's like so unreadable in this format. They're doing a null terminating character. Great, so I could tab this over, I guess. Is that a hard tab? Let's just space this. Okay, cool. So we've got our fragment shader source set up. Then we need to make this. So uh, unsigned int fragment shader, I assume. And then frag, <laughs> fragment, fragment shader is gonna be equal to uh, geo create shader. GL fragment shader instead. And then um, GL shader source is going to be uh, fragment shader. Size is just one. And then the 
for attacks, or sorry, fragment shade resource. And then I assume I still, do I still do null for this one? And then GL compile shader. Was I supposed to do GL? Oh, uh, well, I didn't compile the vertex shader. <laughs> I just realized. So we actually don't know if there were any issues. <clears throat> Why does control D duplicate a line? Why do I ever want that? Such a weird. Okay, I forgot to compile that. So now I should run this again, actually, because before I was like, oh, there are no runtime errors, but I actually was not testing that correctly. Well, this seems fine, I think. Okay, so I should actually put this in here still. Okay, let's just copy this in here. So this is int success, uh, our info log, and we're getting the shader IV. I don't know what that is. But the vertex shader, the geo compile status, and success. So we check if compilation was successful with get shader IV. If compilation failed, we should retrieve an error message. So um, if there wasn't success, if, there wasn't, if, if not success, then let's go ahead and gl get shader info log vertex shader uh, buffer size is 512, which is our info log. And then null is, uh, what is that? Length, I don't know what that is the length of. And then the info log is info log. And then out that use this weird format they're using it's actually not a terrible format to be honest and then slash n um, info log print that to the screen and then print out ml um, and then we want to go ahead and do this so i probably what i probably should do is uh, generalize this into a function, but I won't do that right now, and I'll instead just copy and paste it twice. And instead of the vertex shader, we'll go ahead and check for the fragment shader, and then here we'll check for the fragment shader, and then this should be fragment instead. Oh shit, what a fast ice cream delivery. Let's go, dude. You can drop it off in seven minutes. Speedy, speedy. All right, so now let's go ahead and uh, control shift. Control F5, not control shift. Build errors. Redefinition of success. Oh, that's true. Well, well this is actually isn't fine because I need, I need two of these. Pressing the wrong things here. Um, okay. Great. 
That should work now. It's uh, it's kind of written poorly, but it's fine. Source CPP line 96. Oh, I put a tick in there. Yeah, what is going on there actually? It has to do with the order of how um, I'm pressing key my keys on my keyboard, but. Um, okay, seemingly the compilation worked. Looks like I didn't output anything. Great, so we did our fragment shaders. So now we have to link the shader objects into a shader program. Uh, I guess I don't have to keep these, right? Because like I already did them. So presumably I don't have to keep these. Um, a shader program is the uh, a shader program object is the final linked version of multiple shaders combined. To use the recently compiled shaders, we have to link them into a shader program object and then activate the shader program when rendering objects. The activated shaders program shaders um, activated shaders activated shader programs shaders will be used when we issue render calls. Okay. So when linking the shaders into a program, it links the outputs of each shader to the inputs of the next shader. Okay, so it just forms that loop we saw earlier. This is also where you get linking errors if your outputs and inputs do not match. Creating a program object is easy. Let's make a note for that. Shader program. This is unsigned in shader program. And then shader program is equal to gl creates program. Okay, it creates a program or returns the ID reference to the newly created program object. Okay, now we need to attach the previously compiled shaders to the program object and link them with GeoLink program. Okay. So GL attach shader. Give it the shader program, and then it also gets the shader. So we'll do the vertex shader first. Then we've got attach shader, and then shader program, and then fragment shader. Great. And then we have GL link program which I assume we do in the program, shader program, that's what we call it. This code should be pretty self-explanatory. We attach the shaders to the program and link them. Yep. Just like shader compilation, we can also check if linking a shader program uh, failed and retrieve the corresponding log. However, instead of using GL get shader IV and info log, we now use your program IV. Okay, so let's check this. And then we'll need to define um, success. So that's me, car star. That's the part I don't remember. No. So then, if success isn't a thing, then we get geo program info log, and then we can go ahead and SDC out. Um, let's say error. Shader program failed to link, I guess. And then I guess a new line. Um, ah! and then we go ahead and do, we need to display the info log. Um, okay, so I think that should be enough to try and figure out what's going on here. Um, seems like everything worked. I mean, presumably, I'm not drawing anything, so I guess we don't know yet. Mm. Okay, so the result is a program object we can activate by calling GI use program with the newly created program object. Oh, that's probably why I didn't do anything. GL use program. Shader program. Cool. So if we do, if we compile after that. Okay. Every shader and rendering call after GL use program will not use this program object and thus the shaders that we wrote. Neat. Um, oh yeah, and don't forget to delete the shader objects since we've linked them into the program objects. We no longer need them anymore. Okay. 
GL delete shader vertex. Oh, interesting. So they're, I guess they're linked and then you just, huh. I would not expect that, but that's fine. All right, so right now we sent the input vertex data to the GPU and instructed the GPU how to process the vertex data with the vertex and fragment shader. We're almost there, but not quite. OpenGL does not know yet how it should interpret the vertex data in memory and how it should connect the vertex data to the vertex shader's attributes. We'll be nice and tell OpenGL how to do that, okay? So the vertex shader allows us to specify any input we want in the form of vertex attributes. And while this allows for great flexibility, it doesn't mean we have to manually specify what part of our input data which goes to which vertex. Oh, okay. So now we're telling you how to interpret this array. So we have vertex one, X, Y, Z. And then this is bytes. Okay, yeah, those are four bytes each. They're stored as 32-bit, four-byte floating point values. Each position is composed of three of those values, and there's no space or other values between them. They're tightly packed. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first value in the data is the beginning of the buffer. With this knowledge, we can tell OpenGL how it should interpret the vertex data using GL vertex attribute pointer. Dang, this file is already getting kind of large. Uh, GL vertex attribute pointer. So the index is zero that we start at. The size is there's three for that. The type is a float. Um, is it normalized? I don't know what normalized means, but apparently we're saying false. And I don't know why we have to say DL false instead of just like, what are we writing zero? Um, what is this? The stride? Oh, so the stride is uh, the size, the total size of a vertex in bytes. I think size of returns bytes, right? Is that correct? Just remember, the, with the Vulkan API, if I remember correctly, you're looking at like a thousand lines to get a triangle on the screen. Uh, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's so much, holy shit. Vulkan's the new fancy one, right? I have that on my computer. It told me that. Oh, this is gonna take like 10 years again. I don't know why I opened this. All right, well, whatever. Um, okay, and then what's, what's the next, what's the next parameter here? The pointer? What's the pointer to? So it's giving us, is this how you make a null pointer? Huh, didn't know that. And then we tell GL enable vertex attribute array. Okay. Vulcan's a lower level graphics API. OpenGL hides a lot of the nitty and gritty from you. Oh, okay, okay. Even though you still got quite a lot of, yeah, I'll say this is still a lot. The triangle has still not been drawn and our file is almost at 100 lines. And not to mention this is also with, um, as far as I understand it, this is with GLFW, I think even abstracting some of the OpenGL work away, right? Cause like if I didn't have GLFW, then like I'd have to be creating the window object myself and doing some other stuff myself, which I don't know if that's more work or less work. But like this entire thing, the window hints, <clears throat> I'd have to do all that myself as far as I understand, so. Um, okay, so the first parameter specifies which vertex attribute we want to configure. Remember that we specified the location, the position vertex attribute, and the shader with layout location equals zero. Okay, so I actually don't understand what a vertex attribute is, but we'll keep reading. Um, so the next, but the important part here is that this is zero because we set it to be zero in our vertex shader. We said the location is zero. Um, okay, so the next argument specifies the location 
or this, sorry, it specifies the size of the vertex attribute, which is, again, three points. It's a vec three, okay? The third argument specifies the type of the data, which is GL float, which is a, uh, a vector in GLSL consists of floating point values, sure. Um, the next argument specifies if we want the data to be normalized. If we're inputting integer data types, uh, and we've set this to GL true, the integer data is normalized to zero in one when converted to float. This is not relevant for us, we'll leave this to GL false. Okay. Uh, definitely more work, though. I think GLFW is just a lightweight windowing framework. Without it, you'd have to do a lot of your own platform specific window stuff. Yeah, so for reference, I've been looking into this uh, via Handmade Hero, which is like its own thing. Um, and it's actually like a pretty long running, uh, yeah, a pretty long running thing at this point. So this is this game developer, Casey Muratori, who like goes through his streams on Twitch every week. And has been making this entire game completely from scratch. Um, and so you can like get it. I, I need to actually get the source code. I'm really interested in seeing it. Uh, as far as I know, it does everything from scratch. Um, so, he talks about portability, but I don't think he's even using GLF, GLFW. So, um, and the videos, I'm, I'm watching these videos slowly but surely. It's just they take a little bit because they're weekly streams and all that, you know, so. Um, but I think he does everything himself there. Pretty sure. I mean, yeah, he's doing it to show that like this is this is everything, right? You know, he's showing truly down to the nitty gritty, like the absolute base layer of it, which I think is a, a good way to learn it, right? Yes, it's a lot more work, and like maybe you won't do you know your first actual game with that, but I think knowing how that works underneath is like probably not a terrible thing. Okay, hold on, I'll be right back. Give me one second.
Alright, we're back. Ice cream has been successfully taken inside. There's a GLFW for JavaScript? Oh, really? Wait, what? Why? Like, is this for Node? Huh. I don't know that I'd want to do this, though. Like, why? Why would you... Why? Why? <laughs> I have I have many questions. Most of them are why. I don't think Node's that performant, right? Why would you do graphics processing with Node? That doesn't that doesn't seem like I and I like JavaScript. That doesn't seem like a good idea. JavaScript's fine as like you know a server side thing if you're like making like web servers or something with it, because that's like relatively fast for that. But I don't know. Maybe you know you can write it in JS and you know maybe it's fine, but. <clears throat> um, okay, where are we? So, um, the fifth argument is known as the stride, and it tells us the space between consecutive vertex attributes. Since the next set of position data is located exactly three times the size of a float away, we specify that as the stride. Okay. Oh, because it's tightly packed, we could have also specified it as zero. Whenever we have more vertex attributes, we have to carefully define the spacing between each vertex attribute. We'll see more examples of that later on. Okay. And then the last parameters of type void star, uh, void pointer, and thus requires that, that weird cast. This is the offset of where the position data begins in the buffer. Since the position data is at the start of the data array, the value is just zero. We'll explore this parameter in detail later on. Sure. Each vertex attribute takes its data from memory, managed by a VBO, in which VBO it takes from data in which view that takes data from is determined by the VBO currently bound to GL array buffer when calling vertex attribute pointer. Since the previous law defined VBO is still bound before calling it, vertex attribute zero is now associated with it. See, I don't understand what this is saying. Since the previously defined VBO is still bound before calling it, sure. Vertex attribute zero is now associated with its vertex data. Yeah, I don't understand what's going on there, but we're gonna yeah we're gonna continue to move on. Same TVH. All right, that that's that's a little comforting. Um. Okay, now now that we specified how OpenGL should interpret the vertex data, we should also enable the vertex attribute with GL enable vertex attribute array, giving the vertex attribute location as its argument. Vertex attributes are disabled by default. Yeah, what the fuck is a vertex attribute? Vertex attributes are used to communicate from outside to the vertex shader. <clears throat> Unlike uniform variables, values are provided per vertex and not global for all vertices. There are built-in vertex attributes like the normal or the position, or you can specify your own vertex attribute like a tangent or another custom value. Oh, so this is literally just like things that are associated with the vertex? I still don't understand what they're saying, like, in the context here, but I guess that's fine. We initialize the vertex data in a buffer using a vertex buffer object, set up a vertex in fragment shader, and told OpenGL how to link the vertex data to the vertex shader's vertex attributes. The things you use layout for?
All right, so drawing an, uh, an object in OpenGL will now look something like this. <clears throat> Copy our vertices array into a buffer. Then set the vertex attribute pointers. Okay, so, so sorry, I'm gonna read through this real quick. So you copy the vertices array in a buffer for OpenGL to use, okay? Then you set the vertex attributes pointers. Is that what we did here? Yeah. Then we use our shader program when we wanna render an object. Okay, yep. Yeah. Now we draw the object, some OpenGL function that draws a triangle, okay? So we have to repeat this process every time we want to draw an object, which is every render loop, right? It's every frame. Imagine if we have five vertex attributes and perhaps hundreds of different objects, which is not uncommon. Binding the appropriate buffer objects and configuring all vertex attributes for each of those objects quickly becomes cumbersome. Um, okay. So a vertex array object, also known as a VAO, can be bound just like a vertex buffer object. And any subsequent vertex attribute calls from that point on will be stored inside the VAO. This has the advantage that when configuring vertex attribute pointers, you only have to make those calls once. And whenever we want to draw the object, we can just bind the corresponding VAO. This makes switching between different vertex data and attribute con configurations as easy as binding a different VAO. All the state we just set is stored inside the VAO. Core OpenGL requires that we use a VAO so it knows what to do with our vertex inputs. If we fail to bind one, it will most likely refuse to draw anything. So what is the store? It stores a calls to enable vertex attribute array, which is here, or geo disable vertex attribute array. Uh, contains vertex attribute configurations via GL vertex attribute pointer, which is here. Vertex buffer objects associated with vertex attributes by calls to VX attribute pointer. So, so VVOs are the entire buffers, right? And then the attribute, oh, this stores the attributes, okay. So are the attributes essentially are, so like in this case, are the attributes just like the, the shaders and stuff? Like what we're using to render that vertex? Am I understanding that correctly? Like you can, it's basically saying that each vertex could be rendered by a different shader. So the vertex attributes are specifying what shader we're using to render it. Is that, I don't know if that's accurate. This is the most confusing thing for me so far, so far, because I don't know what's going on here. to make a VAO. <laughs> and then all we have to do to, is to use it, we have to bind the VAO using bind vertex array. I don't know if I do that down here, but I'm going to. Vertex buffer contains the data of all your vertices. Vertex array object describes how that data is laid out for the shader. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Because again, it takes this data. Hmm, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so we actually need to do the, we need to do the VA, VAO part first. And then 
GL bind vertex array. I can't type. And then we copy our vertices array in a buffer for OpenGL to use, which is bind buffer, buffer data. I don't know why there are so many spaces here. Then we set our vertex attribute pointers. Go down here. Okay. And then drawing the code in the render loop, we draw the program, or draw the object. So we do GL use program. Yeah, the only confusing part about this tutorial, or the, like the, the thing I've been the most confused about so far is that like, it doesn't necessarily specify like where all of this should go. All right, GL bind vertex array, yo. Okay, so and that's it. Everything we did in the last two million pages led up to this moment, a VAO that stores our vertex attribute configuration and which we VAO to use. Usually when you have multiple objects you want to draw, you first can generate slash configure all the VAOs. And thus the required VVO and attribute pointers and serve this for later use. The moment we want to draw one of our objects, we take the corresponding VAO, bind it, then draw the object and unbind the VAO again. Okay. Uh, so the triangle we all have been laying for, uh, to draw our objects of choice, OpenGL provides us with the GL draw erase function that draws primitives using the currently active shader, the previously defined vertex attribute configuration, and with the VVO's vertex data, indirectly bound via the VAO. So we use, use the program, bind the vertex array, and then we do GL draw arrays. Dang, we got hella fireworks going off over here, y'all. GL triangles. Uh, first three. Since I said at the start we want to draw a triangle, and I don't like lying to you, we pass GL triangles, sure. Specifies the starting index of the vertex array, so we leave it at zero, and specifies how many vertices we want to draw, which is three. Now try and compile the code and work your way backwards if any errors pop up. Okay, so let's uh, let's see what happens, I guess. So control F5. Oh shit, that's not correct. Well, we have a triangle. It's not correct though. Um, Above description may not be, may be wrong. Wait, what? Uh, so if we're doing zero, zero, it should be, what is this? So it's X then Y, right? So negative five, negative five. And then we have five, negative five. Oh, this should be zero and then five. Yeah, I just typed in the coordinates wrong. It is a good triangle, oh my lord. Uh, wait, why is that yelling at me? Oh, it's because I didn't close out of the previous one. Okay. I do have Vulcan. Okay. I open the earlier. Okay, control F5. There we go. Okay, triangle fixed. I just had the coordinates wrong. Great. <clears throat> oh, my description at the tutorial. Gotcha. Yeah. Nice. Oh, well, we have a triangle. Fuck yeah. And it took how many lines of code? Fucking 120? Holy shit, dude. It's kind of wild. It's quite a bit. Quite a bit. All right, well, what's next? We've conquered the triangle.
There's one last thing we'd like to discuss when rendering vertices, and that is element buffer objects, abbreviated to EBO. To explain how element buffer objects work, it's best to give an example. Suppose we want to draw a rectangle instead of a triangle. Sure. We can draw a rectangle using two triangles. Oh no, is everything just triangles? Oh no. Okay, so we have our first triangle, and then we have a second triangle. So that makes sense you to make a right triangle on the upper half and a right triangle that's the bottom half. Okay. <clears throat> I assume that's what they're doing here because this is five, five, which is here, five, negative five, and then negative five, five. Yes, that's, yep. Yeah. And the second one is five, negative five, negative five, negative five, uh, negative five, five. Yep. So as you can see, there is some overlap. Yeah, because bottom right and top left are twice. Yeah, so we're including. Yeah, okay, so there's gonna be overlaps. What would be a better solution is to store only the unique vertices and then specify the order which we wanna draw these vertices in. In that case, we could only have to store four vertices for the rectangle and then just specify which order we would like to draw them. Oh yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so thankfully, element buffer objects work exactly like that. It's a buffer, just like a vertex buffer object, which is what we're using here. <clears throat> uh, that stores indices that OpenGL uses to decide what vertices to draw. This so-called index drawing is exactly the solution to our problem. To get started, we first have to specify the unique vertices and the indices to draw them as a rectangle. So our vertices, we just need to specify a... Uh, let's go ahead and... Oh, wait, hold on. This is where I'd actually want to duplicate this line. Oh my god. Visual Studio actually knows what I want. I thought it didn't, but it knows. That's why I think in the Unreal 5 engine demo, they talk about billions of triangles. That makes sense, yeah. <laughs> it's all triangles? Always has been. I'm gonna do that meme. And the, these two should be negative. Okay, and then we need to specify a second variable called unsigned int indices, which is an array. I can't spell indices very well. Um, this should be equal to... We start from zero, so the first triangle is zero, one, three. So again, zero is <coughs> five, five, so that's the upper left point. One is five, negative five, and then three is negative five, five. So that's that upper triangle. And then the second triangle is one. Yeah, so two and three are here, right? These are the, the two, sorry. These are the two corners. And then the unique ones are the, the, the other corners. So for the first one, we get the two common ones. And then we get this first corner, which is zero. And the second one, we get the two common corners and then our other corner, which is down here. So one and three are the common ones, and then in this case, we have two as the other corner. That makes sense. Yeah, we only need four vertices instead of six. Cool, okay. So next we need to create the element buffer object. Notice the order of the indices here. Zero, one is here. Yeah, why is it not? It doesn't, it has to be one, two, like is it always ascending order? Or, or is it just dependent on, it differs between vertexes drawn clockwise and counterclockwise. Oh, why? <laughs> okay, so the first one you're drawing, zero is here, so you're drawing that's clockwise, right? And then the next one is one, two, three. So one is five, negative five. Two is... Oh, so it draws all of them clockwise. Okay. Oh, to determine front facing, back facing. God. Oh man, 3D games stress me out. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Um, okay, so next we need to create the element buffer object. 
Um, oh, I should leave a note of that. Order matters here. Open GL. Um, Okay, I'll let myself know to that. So now instead of a VAO, I need an EVO. So many good, so many good abbreviations here. If you're trying to do a keep on one or you're missing sides, check the order. Got it, got it. Uh, GL gen buffers. Oh, I forgot that uh, escape will close the window for me. I programmed that early on and I have not used it yet, I don't think. <clears throat> okay, similar to the VBO, we also bind the EBO and copy the indices over to the buffer with GL buffer data. Also, just like the VBO, we want to place those calls between a bind and an unbind call, although this time we apply, we specify GL element array buffer as the buffer type. I, I assume I still keep my VAO though. I think it's that song. I just don't like the vocals or like vocal lyrical lo-fi is not what I want. Okay, so it's basically the same here, except we're saying GL elements array buffer and instead of our VBO it's gonna be an EBO and this is gonna be the same um, and it's the size of instead of the vertices it's the indices So can't spell indices and then GL static draw, which we have. Okay, so how do the indices relate to the vertices though? We're still not referencing the vertices at all, right? Uh, note that we're now giving GL element array buffer as the buffer target. Uh, the last thing left to do is replace the GL draw arrays called GL draw elements. So GL bind we have to do GL bind buffer. GL element array buffer. I uh, do I have to rebind the buffer here? Am I missing an unbind? What's going on here? That doesn't seem right. That's, that's confusing. What am I supposed to bind and unbind? I'll see that when I look at the final source code for this. That's fine. So we bind the buffer. Then we use GL. Uh, let's get rid of this. Draw elements. GL triangles. This is where an open GL referred to as an element buffer, but in other places you might see it referred to as an index buffer. Okay, that's good to know. Six. This is GL unsigned int. Oh yeah, because this is the indexes, not the which means it's the the vectors. They're just ints. Say zero.
Okay, so the first argument specifies the mode we want to draw in, so we're going to draw arrays. The second argument is the count or the number of elements. We specified six indices. Um, so we want to draw six vertices in total. The third argument is the type of indices, which is of type GL and sign int. The last argument allows us to specify an offset in the EBO or pass in the index array, but that is when you're not using element buffer objects. Um, but we're just going to leave this at zero. And then the draw elements function takes its indices from the EBO currently bound to the GL array buffer. The last element buffer object that gets bound while a VAO is bound is stored as the VAO's, VAO's element buffer object. Binding to a VAO then also, also automatically binds that EBO. A VAO stores the G... Okay. VAO stores the GL bind buffer calls when the target is the GL element array buffer. This also means it stores its unbind calls to make sure you don't unbind the element array buffer before on your VAO. That's the thing you've configured. Oh, so I actually got rid of some code that I shouldn't have. Yeah, because we still need the VBO. That's how it gets linked. So we first have to bind the vertex array object, which we're doing here. VAO GL bind vertex array. We need to copy our vertices array. Oh, it's a buffer of indices. That's very true, yes. <laughs> okay, so copy our vertices array in a vertex buffer for OpenGL to use. This is bind buffer. So all this generation code actually goes above this sort of binding code, right? Gen vertex. Okay, so they're defining them all. Yeah, I guess we can all do them in one line. That makes sense. So you need all three. The EBO is not replacing the VBO. It's just an extra thing on top of it. So gen vertex arrays is one. Yep. And then we're genning buffers is the other one. Gen. Oh, so both are buffers. One is a vertex buffer. One is a, it's calling it a what? A element buffer and or an indice buffer. That makes more sense. Okay, so, um, and then yeah, we're binding the VBO, which again, I got rid of, but I shouldn't have. Okay, so now we can go back to that explanation. Where, so this is the, um, um, let's put init code. So first we're in binding our vertex array object, great. Then we copy our vertices array in a vertex buffer for OpenGL to use. Again, that's the VBO, so GL bind buffer. And then we're doing it, it's an array buffer. So this is the code we set up before for to draw the triangle the first time. And then we attach to our VBO. And it's buffer data, right? So buffer data, GL, L, or array buffer. And then also, uh, yeah, here, what do we have to give? I'm trying to get the hints for the function to show up. They're not. Anyways, so it's the size of um, vertices. Size of the vertices, then we need to actually give it the vertices. Then it needs to have the, is the mode right, I think, is the static draw part. Why do I have 
notification. An update to live share is available. I do not care about that. Thanks though. Okay, so that is copying the vertices into a vertex buffer. Then we're gonna copy our index array into an element buffer, which is the new part here, um, which we've already done. Then we need to set the vertex attribute pointers, which is GL vertex attribute pointer, which is we did this function earlier. Three times salsa. And then GL enable vertex attribute array, which we sort of talked about earlier, which is to save by default. Uh, okay, so all this shader init stuff um, I should be able to move this above this then okay I'll put that in the 10 section I'm I'm I think I'm starting to get the the order of things better here Maybe not though. <laughs> um, okay, so then this is actually doubled, right? So let's go ahead and delete this. So this is the actual init code. The drawing code in the render loop, we have to use our program, shader program. Uh, we bind, we go ahead and bind our vertex array, which is our VBO. Uh, we then need to go ahead and wait, do we have to bind this buffer? Oh, I guess not, because we already did. Can we already bind the vertex array though? That should be VAO, sorry, not VBO. Yeah, so I think there's an unbind here, and I think I'm gonna, when I look through the source code again, I think that's what's gonna happen. And that's what I'm missing, but. And then we do GL bind vertex array zero. Like, why do we unbind that there? <clears throat> okay, so let's try this. Well, it gave us a rectangle. It's hard to abstract all this stuff because there's too many fine details to control. Yeah. And it seems like there's a lot. <laughs> I don't have to unbind it. Yeah, but it, it, it sort of expects me to, I think. All right, well, we have a rectangle. Uh, okay, and then wireframe. How do you put it in wireframe mode? Is that a GL wireframe? Is that a GL line? Is that wireframe mode? My friend has too many alcohols. Yeah, no worries, dude. Thanks for hanging out. Have a good rest of your night. Stay safe. Oh, scroll down a bit. New thing. Okay, cool. Oh, sorry. I was going to try it. So it's yelling at me because I didn't do this. I press escape and it closes it. Okay, so to draw your triangles in wireframe mode, you can configure how OpenGL draws its primitives. So let's change this back to GL triangle before I get myself more trouble. Um, oh, I spelled triangles wrong. The uh, GL polygon mode, GL front and back, GL line. The first argument says we want to apply it to the front and back of all triangles, and the second line tells us to draw them as lines. Any subsequent drawing calls will run to the triangles in wireframe mode until we set it back to its default. Uh, if you have any errors, work your way backwards to see if you miss anything. Okay. So we can just copy this and put it up towards the top. All 
or I can just put it here, I guess, but. Okay. Control five. Nice. Yeah, two triangles. Okay. So I think things are starting to somewhat make sense. Um, oh, I could set a... This is this is applying what we've learned so far. Um, I can do else if uh, glfw get key uh, window glfw key should be equal to, uh, we'll say w is equal to glfw uh, press. Uh, how do I get the current polygon mode? Because this will turn it into wireframe mode, but will only turn it back, right? Which is not good. Uh, but I can't do this, though. It is indeed very triangular. Oh, did I, did I just copy that? Yeah, I did. So now it looks normal, but if you press W, it'll turn it into wireframe mode. Fuck yeah. That's kind of cool. That's applying your skills, baby. I just don't know how to, uh, is there a way for me to tell what mode it's in? I'd have to like set a variable otherwise, which is, I mean, I guess I could do, but. Oh, I could just actually set it up to where if it releases. In polygon mode equals GL get integer V. Oh, weird. Out of curiosity, where did you like, where did you find that? Is there like a good docs for this that I'm missing? Poly, polygon, more like polygon. <laughs> I'm not funny at all. You saying get integer V? The property aim here is GL polygon mode. And then it puts it by reference into polygon mode. Yeah, it doesn't return anything, right? Oh, is that like the actual OpenGL reference? Okay. Oh, this is 4.5. I'm on 3.3, excuse me. Well, I'm actually on like 4.6 or something, but. Oh, and it's like just like GL get integer V. Get, okay, so GL get returns the value or values of a selected parameter. Okay. It's so weird that they don't actually return anything and instead put it by reference into a data. Is that common? Why is that? Like, that seems very odd to me. It feels like it should just return it. Am I naive? Uh, the small, naive C++ babby that does not know why that's a thing? Um, so polygon mode, and then if uh, polygon... What is this? This is a... Enum mode to use equals um, then if polygon mode is equal to GL 
line, then uh, mode to use is going to be equal to GL. Uh, okay, it's fill, right? I assume. Does this work? Let's find out. It's a C API, so a lot of things are super weird. Good to know. Oh fuck, why is that not working? No! Oh, yeah, thank you. That's why. I was like, am I checking this wrong? Thank you. <laughs> That's a really obvious thing. <laughs> That's... I forget that, like, it's rendering, you know, probably, like, 60 frames a second or whatever, so, like... Okay, well, I don't really know how to slow that down, and we don't really have to worry about that because that was like a useless feature to implement, but. Um, pretty neat, pretty neat. If you managed to draw a triangle or a rectangle just like we did, then congratulations, you managed to make it past one of the hardest parts of modern OpenGL, drawing your first triangle. Fuck yeah. I control the rendering speed? I mean, yes, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah. I mean, yes, yes, that's true, but. Right now you're probably just running at the fastest frame that you possibly can. Yeah, I think that's correct. Because I set that in the hints, right? Is that accurate? My window hints. Um, okay. So, thankfully we made it past the barrier and the upcoming chapters will hopefully be much easier to understand. I think I'm starting to get it, I think. Um, Anton, Jerdalands, take on rendering the first triangle, take on rendering our first triangle, some extra insights into vertex buffer objects. Uh, there are a lot of steps involved in this chapter. If you're stuck, maybe worthwhile to read up with debugging, okay. And advice to work through them before continuing the next subject, make sure you get a good grasp of what's going on. Try to draw two triangles next to each other using GL draw arrays by adding more vertices to your data. Okay. Now create the same two triangles using two different VAOs and VBOs for the data. Okay. And create two shader programs where the second program uses a different fragment shader that outputs the color yellow. Draw both triangles again where one outputs the color yellow. Ooh, these are good challenges. Okay. Okay, so it is like 10 o'clock and I've been streaming for a little bit and my voice is bleh. So I'm probably gonna call it now. This has been really fun actually. And I drew a fucking rectangle and a triangle. So I'm psyched about that actually. Um, <laughs> it's just super, it's like, I was not, I'll be honest. I was not expecting to have this much fun. Very, very entertaining, even though it's like not anything crazy, right? Like I'm not doing anything notable, so. Um, that's pretty cool. I'm excited to do more. So, uh, Nikki is gone for this weekend, so there's a good chance I'll probably stream either tomorrow or Friday. Um, we'll see how I'm feeling, I guess. I need to play Path of Exile at some point, so. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's the plan. Thank you everyone for joining in. Um, if you are interested on interested in figuring out when I'm going to go live next. Um, Twitter would be the best place for that. I'll post on there before I go live. It's exclamation mark Twitter in the chat. We'll get you the link to that, but it's just at Reno and MO if you prefer typing. Um, 
let me, I am trying to look for someone for us to throw a little hosty host over to. Um, who is online? Oh, Dylan is online. Let's go host Dylan. So, uh, I'm going to send you over to my good friend Dylan. Uh, if you are heading out, then have a good rest of your night. Um, if not, you know, feel free to stick around and say hello. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, check my Twitter if I'm going live. Hopefully, we'll do Bright tomorrow or the day after. Um, and then on Sunday at 9 a.m. Central, bright and early, we'll be doing our tabletop streams like normal. Again, these are going to be sort of like weeknight streams as a supplement. My main project is still doing tabletop, but I don't want to like overwork myself on it. And again, this is different and cool. And I'm learning a lot, I'm expanding my brain. So um, it's neat. So yeah, we'll go ahead and throw him. I guess we'll throw him a raid real quick. I really have to go to the bathroom. So we're going to try and do that. Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, once more, if you haven't already, uh, be sure to follow the channel. You'll get notifications whenever I go live as well. And it, you know, helps boost numbers, which look good. So, um, again, if you're staying for Dylan's stream, uh, say hello. If not, then uh, have a good rest of your night, and uh, I'll see y'all later. I have to click start raid, so, you know, of course, this. Uh... Wait, actually, how does this work? Can I... Does it automatically do it? Am I a dingus? I can't click the raid now button. That's why I was trying to... Okay. Uh... Alright, we're here for real. Alright, I will see you all later. Oh, they're not going to know how to return it.